Hey, how are you doing? So today's topic is extra parameter tracks. So let's get started. All right. So let's start with extra parameter tracks. We have completed parameter tracks in a previous video. If you haven't watched it, I suggest you go and watch it because there will be a lot of correlations. So let's start with extra parameter tracks. So how are descending tracks in general classified? They are classified either as pyramidal tracts or extra pyramidal tracts and this classification is based on their location in the medulla oblongata. Alright? So with this brief revision, let's start with the extra pyramidal tract. The first extra pyramidal tract for the day is the rubrospinal tract. Now, in extra pyramidal tracts, the name of the tracts gives us a lot of idea about that tract. For example, rubro. Rubro means red. Therefore, this tract originates in the red nucleus. Where is the red nucleus located? It is located in the midbrain. Alright? So, the red nucleus in the midbrain receives nerve fibers from corticospinal tract and the primary motor cortex. From these regions, they specifically go to the lower part of the red nucleus, forming a special part known as magnocellular part. Alright? And this magnocellular part contains large neurons that are similar to the bed cell that are found in the primary motor cortex that give rise to large neurons in the corticospinal tract. Alright? So, now after uh, giving rise to nerve fibers in from the magnocellular part, the nerve fibers cross over to the other side immediately and they go down in the lateral column of the spinal cord. This tract goes down the lateral column of the spinal cord and it has a similar course to that of the lateral corticospinal tract. It also has similar functions as uh, corticospinal tract because they also terminate on the lateral group of anterior horn cells and then they provide uh, nerve fibers to the distal group of muscles. So just as corticospinal tract controls precision movements of the hands, the fine movements of the fingers, the cord the Rubrospinal tract also controls these movements along with corticospinal tract. Alright, so rubrospinal tract is pretty similar to the corticospinal tract. So now after doing the first cortico first extra pedimental tract for the day, that is the rubrospinal tract, let's move on to the next, that is the vestibulospinal tract. The vestibulospinal tract. Now vestibulospinal tract also gives us the name gives us the idea of the origin of the tract, that is the vestibular nuclei. So, there are two vestibular nuclei, that is the lateral and the medial vestibular nuclei. The lateral vestibular nuclei is also called as diter's nucleus. As diter's nuclei. Alright? Now, these lateral and vestibular nuclei receive inputs from where? They receive inputs from the vestibular apparatus. The lateral vestibular nucleus receives specifically from the utricles. There, since they receive inputs from the utricles from the vestibular apparatus present in the inner ear, they control uh, posture during linear acceleration. During linear acceleration, the posture is controlled by the nerve fibers or the impulses arising from the lateral vestibular nucleus. And medial vestibular nucleus also receives inputs from the vestibular apparatus, specifically the semicircular canals. Since they received from the semicircular canals, they control the angular acceleration. Alright, so during angular acceleration, the posture is maintained by the nerve fibers or the impulses that arise in the medial vestibular nuclei. After originating in the vestibular nuclei, they pass down ipsilaterally. They pass down ipsilaterally that is along the same side and they terminate on the medial group of anterior horn cells. All right. So the after termination, they give off nerve fibers. They give off nerve fibers to the proximal group of muscles. They give proximal group muscle group of muscles of the posture. So therefore, they regulate posture, and they give out nerve fibers to them. All right. So that is the rubrospinal and the vestibulospinal tract. After covering these two, we move on to the third. That is the reticulospinal tract. Third is reticulospinal tract. As in the previous two, the names suggested where they originate. Even this suggests us where the tract originates. That is in the reticular formation. They originate in the reticular formation. Now, what is reticular formation? Reticular formation are 
groups of neurons that are present in the midbrain and the medulla so that is in the pons and the medulla there are scattered neurons present that give rise to this reticular formation since there are two types there are pontine and ret- pontine reticular formation and medullary reticular formation the pontine reticular formation gives off nerve fibers that take that take the course in the spinal cord as the anterior white column all right and they terminate on the medial group of horn cells even the medullary reticular formation terminate on the medial group of horn cells but they constitute the lateral white column of the spinal cord pontine is the anterior white column the medullary reticular formation is the lateral white column now there is a difference between the functions of pontine and medullary reticular formation both of them supply the same group of muscles they supply the proximal group of muscles muscles and maintain posture but they have different functions over there the pontine reticular formation is excitatory in nature they are excitatory in nature therefore they stimulate those muscles to contract and medullary reticular formations have an inhibitory nature therefore they inhibit the contraction that is they relax those muscles and the coordination between these two the pontine reticular formation medullary reticular formation helps you do different actions like walking jumping sitting standing because the coordination between the anti gravity that are the posture muscles is maintained by these no fibers or these no tracts all right so that is reticulo spinal tract now we move on to the third the fourth and the final uh, corti- final extra pyramidal tract that is the tecto spinal tract the tecto spinal tract the tecto spinal tract originate in the tectum all right so tectum is the area in the midbrain all right in the cerebral peduncle so after originating in the tectum they cross over to the other side immediately and then they move down ipsilaterally after moving down ipsilaterally they terminate on the medial group of anterior horn cells just like the reticulo spinal tract and they terminate and supply no fibers to the proximal group of muscles all right so they cross over to the tegmentum and they form the white co- anterior white column of the spinal cord so we saw that the pontine reticular formation also forms the anterior white column of the spinal cord and the tecto spinal tract also forms the re- anterior white column of the spinal cord they terminate so these tracts do not go down the entire spinal cord they terminate in the cervical region in the cervical region of spinal cord these tracts terminate and because they ter- they go only to the cervical level they supply muscles only till the they supply the muscles of the neck and the face and their function is to have visually guided head movements so they have help they help us in visually guided visually guided head movements so the head movements are controlled by the tecto spinal tract all right so over here in this table we have summarized all the four tracks that i have discussed and two extra tracks that are not so important but they do exist that is the olivo spinal tract and the interstitial spinal tract the olivo spinal tract as the name suggests originates in the inferior olivary nucleus they travel down ipsilaterally and terminate in the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord and they influence muscle activity all right the interstitial spinal interstitial tracts interstitial spinal tracts originate in the interstitial nucleus of the cajal that is present in the midbrain and they travel down ipsilaterally in the anterior white column and terminate on the ventromedial aspect of the spinal cord gray matter and the ter- what is the function of interstitial spinal tract they help in the me- rotation of the body around the longitudinal axis all right so you can download this entire table that we have made for you in the link below along with this diagram there is another diagram that we will be discussing now that is the difference between umn and lmn paralysis before we start let me give you a brief overview what we mean by umn and lmn paralysis for example if this is your brain and this is your spinal cord and these are your muscle fibers we know that nerve fibers originate in the brain go to the spinal cord terminate over there and new group of nerve fibers arise from there that go and supply the muscle fibers so all those lesions that affect these tracts are lead that these tracts lead to umn paralysis 
they lead to UMN paralysis where all those lesions affecting this tract lead to LMN paralysis that is lower motor neuron paralysis and upper motor neuron paralysis now let us understand what is the difference between these two lesions so in human paralysis group of muscles are affected whereas in element paralysis individual muscles are affected now why is it so in human you can understand that these tracts that these tracts these are all parent tracts that is these tracts gives off branches that supply the different muscles since the parent tract is affected all those tra- no bus all those muscles will be affected to which they supply whereas in element paralysis they only supply to those no mus- the these no fiber supply only to specific muscles therefore individual muscles are affected in human paralysis there is no atrophy whereas in element paralysis there is severe atrophy why is it so because the no fiber no fibers innervating the muscle groups are affected only in element paralysis we will see severe atrophy in human paralysis there are no fasciculation seen whereas in element paralysis fasciculations are seen so what are fasciculations fasciculations are twitching of muscle fibers this occurs only in element paralysis this is only seen in element and not in human in human paralysis rigidity is seen whereas in element flaccid paralysis is seen so what do you mean by flaccid paralysis flaccid paralysis when is when your muscles are in a floppy state your hands are very floppy and they do not move in a coordinated way or they do not they cannot be moved in paralysis so that is known as flaccid paralysis now there is increased tendon reflex in human paralysis whereas in element there is decreased tendon reflex so what do you mean by increased tendon reflex tendon reflex are the reflex for example your patellar reflex when you strike the patella with a hammer you there is extension of the leg now this is exaggerated in the human paralysis there will be sudden ex- there will be sudden and uh, excessive extension of the leg in human paralysis whereas in element those reflexes will be reduced in human paralysis there is extensor plantar reflex in element that is normal even if it's present so extensor plantar reflex is the babinski sign that we are talking about we saw in the corticospinal tract that the ext- that if there is a corticospinal tract lesion we see a withdrawal reflex so that is what you mean by extensor plantar reflex is seen in human paralysis all right so with this we complete the extra pyramidal tract and the upper motor neuron paralysis and lower motor neuron paralysis all right so i would like to end the lecture over here so that is all for today's topic i hope you made it made sense i hope you understand the topic you can refer the books now it will make much more sense to you thank you for watching